We have our colleague from student financial planning with us, Marion, and sorry, uh, and she'll be able to um, present the student financial planning portion of this presentation. And we're gonna um, quickly set up her presentation and we'll be right back. Thanks for your patience. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Marion Concilio and I'm here representing the Office of Student Financial Planning, which processes the financial aid for the Graduate School of Architecture. And today we'll be going over some financial aid um, resources as well as some financial wellness resources. Um, on our agenda will be the cost of attendance, uh, different types of student aid, financial well-being, as well as discovering iGrad. So cost of attendance. If anyone here has received financial aid before, then you might have heard of this term cost of attendance. Um, it's basically the total amount of financial aid that a student can borrow. Um, it's often confused for personal expenses, which is your actual cost of your financial obligations. Um, but in reality, your cost of attendance is a representation of school-related financial expenses while you're an enrolled student. Um, the main thing that how this affects students in financial aid, it's the maximum amount of scholarships, student loans, um, work study, any type of financial aid program, this is the maximum amount that you can receive. The cost of attendance is made up of direct costs, such as tuition, fees, anything that the university is directly charging your student account, um, as well as indirect costs, such as living expenses, books, supplies, transportation, and things of that nature. So once you combine your direct costs as well as your indirect costs, that's your cost of attendance or also known as a budget. It does change from year to year, um, but it does stay pretty, uh, within a pretty similar uh, amount. It's important to note that your cost of attendance is not your bill. Your bill will be your direct costs such as tuition and any associated fees. Um, and that will be uh, obviously sent to you after registration. So in terms of federal student aid, well, I guess we'll start with that. Um, it's the most common type of aid that our students uh, tend to take out if they're eligible. You do have to be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen, um, have a valid social security number, be, obviously be enrolled as a regular student, um, at least half time, which is not an issue with architecture since it's a full-time program, um, and maintain satisfactory academic progress. One of the most important things is you do need to complete your free application for federal student aid. There are other resources available, such as private student loans, scholarships, fellowships, uh, employer reimbursements, um, as well as uh, military benefits. If anybody here is a veteran or is military connected in any type of way or a dependent of a military veteran and payment plans. So to be eligible for federal student aid, you do have to be a US citizen um, or a permanent resident. So this full chart describes different scenarios where a student who is not a U.S. citizen might be eligible. Um, but for the most part, the guidance is that as for a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. In terms of federal student aid, we have federal student loans, which can be either unsubsidized or, or um, well, for graduate students, both are, are unsubsidized, but we have the unsubsidized graduate loan and then the graduate plus loan. We also have work study options. Um, if you plan to enroll in summer 2025 um, or thereafter, you would be completing the 25-26 FAFSA. So right now it's a little bit too early to complete this application, but you um, it will become available for this year in December. It's usually available in October, but unfortunately there have been some delays um, this year with the new application. Um, in order to file a FAFSA, there's some things when you sit down on December 1st, hopefully, um, or shortly thereafter, you would need the Columbia University School Code and some personal documents, such as your social security number or your permanent resident number, driver's license, um, your tax information, W-2s maybe, and then visit the um, FAFSA website and then you can log in with your FSA ID. So if you've ever borrowed um, or received financial aid in terms of grants um, or uh, undergraduate student loans, you already will have an FSA ID, but if it's your first time, you will have to create one. Um, and then in terms of the different types of um, federal direct student loans that exist for graduate students, we have the basic criteria, right? It matches the same criteria for federal aid. You have to be enrolled 
at least half time, which is six credits or more, and you have to meet a, a satisfactory academic progress. There's also the entrance counseling master promissory note, but these are all things, obviously, um, hopefully you guys decide to um, apply and enroll. We can go over that a little more detail on accepted students day, um, or as we get closer to the start of the semester that you know, you're all beginning your, your education here at Columbia. So the direct unsubsidized loan is that's one of the loans that students are eligible for after they file the FAFSA. It does provide $20,500 for the academic year, and it does begin accruing interest as soon as the university receives the funds. So the interest rate for this loan is 8.08%. .08%, and there is an origination fee uh, that the government does charge, and it's taken off the top amount of the loan. So you, students don't have to go in and make an extra payment for the origination fee. Um, it's, it's taken off the top of the loan. Then we have the Graduate Plus loan. So for this loan, there's no annual or lifetime aggregate borrowing limit. Um, basically the maximum amount that you can take out in the Graduate Plus loan is your cost of attendance. Uh, the interest rate for this loan is 9.08% and it does have an origination fee of 4.228%. Um, so with the combination of your unsubsidized loan as well as your Graduate Plus loan, you can finance the cost of your education here at Columbia, whether you're only looking for your tuition and fees, um, or if you are looking for a refund for living expenses, you can do that with the combination of both of these loans. It's important to note that the Graduate Plus loan is based on a credit check. Um, but if you do have an adverse credit history, you can uh, submit an appeal to see if that credit check will be overturned and you will be accepted. Or you also have the option to apply for, a, um, for the loan with an endorser. Graduate plus loans, you do need to apply, um, unlike the unsubsidized graduate loan. Once you complete the FAFSA application and you accept it in your student portal, um, that's pretty much all you have to do there on that side of the house. But like I said, the grad plus loan, you do have to apply because it's based on a credit check. Um, so this, um, this slide right here does show the PDF application, but we actually have an online application, which makes it very easy. And it has all of the relevant information right on there to submit electronically. We also have the option of private student loans. So this is a lending option outside of the federal student aid program, but it's an option that many students, both internationally as well as domestically, um, do, do utilize this loan. Um, my um, main recommendation is if you think you can, you have the ability to pay off your uh, loans within 10 years or less, you might wanna consider borrowing privately um, sometimes depending on your credit um, history or on your employment history, you might get a little bit of a lower interest rate. Um, but the interest rates, the fees, the repayment, that's all determined by the private lenders. Um, so if you think you might need a little bit more than 10 years, uh, you might want to consider borrowing federally. So on the right hand side of this um, slide, we have it's just a, a screen grab of the um, uh, it's like a, a tool that the university has in order to help students decide on which type of private student loan or, or where to start, right? Instead of starting with a Google search, you can review our suggested lender list and go through the um, various different, you know, the uh, students use more than just these lenders, but these are the, the most commonly utilized um, lenders. But of course, if you have a different student loan, um, or you're able to secure something outside of this, that's no problem. Students can pursue any lending institution that they, you know, that they wish. Um, um, so main differences between graduate plus loan as well as private loans is mainly your interest rates, your origination rates. Um, when you borrow federally, everything is pretty much stipulated already. You know that it's gonna be a fixed interest rate. You know it's gonna be a fixed origination fee. There are already different um, repayment plans that exist um, after you graduate. So that's stuff you don't have to think about. With private loans, you really have to understand the terms and conditions of the loan because the interest rates can be fixed or they can be variable, variable which means that they can change at any point during the life of the loan. Um, the grace periods can also vary as well. Um, whereas when we borrow federally, we know that that grace period pretty much stays the same. You, you go into repayment six months after you graduate or six months after you're no longer enrolled more than half time or you withdraw from the program. In terms of um, some non-borrowing options, we do have federal work study. Um, this is obviously, it's part of the federal 
uh, financial aid process, and it's not a credit towards your tuition. So it's this is not money that you're going to receive in the way that you would receive a scholarship or a loan, which would reduce the cost of your tuition and fees. This is um, funding that's going to be issued to you in the form of a, of a paycheck. Um, so by finding some type of employment that you're eligible for at the university, um, but the qualifications are the same as for um, different uh, federal aid programs as well. So through work study, most students have the option to earn up to $4,000 a year uh, to help with their cost of education or to help fund their living expenses. Um, just a quick note on processing times and how important it is to file your FAFSA early um, as soon as you can, that December 1st, 2024 date that it becomes live um, because some of the uh, the amount of time it takes for the university to receive your FAFSA and then uh, provide you with a financial aid package. Um, and then the student has to go in and accept that and make their determinations. All of it can take up to 10, 10 business days to two weeks, depending on turnaround times. Um, and communications are sent to the Columbia University email. So that's the email you want to make sure that you're checking um, as pretty much as much as possible to get any type of updates from the university. Now, in terms of refunds, right, what's what's a refund? Why, why would a student be getting a refund? So if a student chooses to finance their education through federal student loan funding or even a private loan, and you're basically getting all of your, you're paying for your uh, cost of tuition and fees in the form of student loans, and you have the ability to borrow extra, right? You have the ability to borrow up to your cost of attendance. So if you choose to do that, you will be receiving a refund. The funds are dispersed to the university, um, and then once the semester starts, a student is eligible to receive the refund. Um, this information is viewable in your SSOL account, which is our student services online system. Um, and the timeline for refund processing, it could be up to two weeks after the start of the term or after the funds are placed on the account. So it's important to note, note, it, note that timeline for refunds, especially if you're using these funds um, to cover your cost of living. On that same note, savings and personal finance, Obviously, it's very it's super important, no matter if you're a student, a full time employee, no matter you know what walk of life you're in. But if you um, the important thing to note here is that if you are using um, your student loans to cover uh, your cost of living, that you, you, they can't be utilized in order to fund the move to New York. You know, if you're living in California and you know you need to move to New York, that money you have to use separately because uh, uh, federal student loans is tied to your enrollment. And we can't disperse that money until very, very close to when the semester starts. Um, so it's strongly recommended that you at least have one or two months of living expenses where you can um, fund your, your lifestyle, food, you know, anything like that, moving, um, in particular, just to, before you are eligible to receive that refund, you know, if you fall in that category. So federal repayment options. Uh, one of the flexibilities of choosing to borrow federally is that there's are, there are quite a few of flexible repayment options. So we have standard tiered income-based repayment plans that all go through the federal, um, federal student aid system. And then there's also different, if you go on the website, there's different repayment tools where you can kind of put in a, the total dollar amount you plan on borrowing and a calculator will kind of, you can play around with a calculator and it'll let you know realistically how long will it take you to pay this money back depending on which plan you choose to enroll in. So there's a lot of helpful options. Um, you know, when, when a student decides that they want to borrow one of these um, options, they do have to complete the master promissory note and the entrance counseling. Um, and that will provide you with a, a ton of information and the opportunity to go onto the website. Um, and like I said, play around with some of these calculators um, to make sure that, you know, this is a decision that you want to go through with and that you feel confident in. This is a list of external scholarships um, for um, uh, international outside scholarships or just regular research opportunities, pretty much scholarship search portal. So you might be aware, uh, familiar with some of them. But if you're not, um, you know, feel free to, to browse some of these websites and see if there's any scholarship opportunities that you might qualify for. Some helpful links and contacts. This is where our office is located. We're in 210 Kent Hall on the Morningside campus. Um, if you contact our office via phone, it's always a financial aid officer that will pick up the phone and they can provide a full service counseling through the phone. Um, if you'd rather a Zoom appointment, anything, whatever's more convenient for you. If you want to come in the office, we're here Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, 
and you don't need an appointment. Somebody, anybody who is working here can um, can meet with you and is well versed um, in you know the financial aid process at the university and specifically with the Graduate School of Architecture. Our office also houses military and veteran affairs. Um, so like I said earlier, if you are a veteran or you are military connected in any way and you might have some benefits available to you, please feel free to contact our office as well. Um, just to note, when you do come into 210 Kent Hall, um, there is an, uh, an iPad in the front, which we urge students to use in order to sign in so that we're aware that you're here. And if there's ever any issues or you're waiting maybe more than like five minutes, definitely give us a call and somebody can, can run out and grab you from the lobby. So at this point, we're going to move on to some financial wellness information um, and just basically some like financial literacy information and go over some resources that are available to students. Um, so what is financial wellness, right? Well, it's defined as a state of being where you have control over your day-to-day -day finances. You have the, compa the capacity to plan for a financial emergency. You're making sure you're on track to meet your goals and you have financial freedom to really live the life that you, you know, the, that you envision for yourself. Now, financial literacy is a, is a skill set, right? It's a skill set of knowing when and how to find reliable information, make an informed financial decision, um, and kind of knowing how to like move forward once you've made that financial decision, right? Um, how does that tie into iGrad? Well, iGrad is a platform that the university uses. It's free. It's web based. Um, it's a financial literacy pl platform that provides lifetime, no cost, personalized financial wellness education and loan management resources to our students, whether you're an active student um, or you're an alum, you know, this is an option that, that is available to you. So you can go on iGrad to view anything from money management, personal finances, scholarship opportunities, which we'll go over in a second. Um, so it's, it's a very, very helpful tool. Um, in terms of financial being and student finances and kind of how do these two things link up, link up there's certain things you want to be mindful of, right, when it comes to determining how much money you want to borrow, right, and truly what you can afford. So in order to do that, I think in a proactive way, you want to look at what are your needs versus wants, what's your income versus your expenses, are you kind of prioritizing and defining some of the goals, um, that you have set up for yourself. And then you want to also think about your spending plan. And then, you know, after you have all of that, you want to either stick to it or you want to see if you need to readjust. So iGrad is a tool that can kind of help you with that. There's diff different types of budgeting um, templates, um, different types of like, even they have like meditation tools and, you know, different ways to think about money. Um, so it really is very helpful. In terms of proactive student um, spending plans and some guidance that we do issue to students, right? The first thing is only borrow what you need. If you know that maybe you're a local student and you still have the opportunity to live at home, then um, you know maybe you don't have to use student loans to subsidize the cost of um, the cost of attending, you know, for for Columbia or for for the Graduate School of Architecture, right? You want to budget to make sure that you know if you've made the decision to only borrow federal loans to cover your tuition and fees, how are you budgeting accordingly so that you're still able to pay your rent, um, pay for food, pay for um, books, or if you need a new laptop for school, you know, things of that nature. So we do urge you to seek non-repayable alternatives um, to student loans first. We have a lot of students that enroll that have been working for some time, um, and they're receiving a sponsorship through their employer, so that's helpful. Um, or students that have, you know, been able to save a little bit of money, so you're at least able to not borrow as much. You know, unfortunately, the reality is that, you know, for a lot of students that come here, they do have to borrow student loans. Um, but if you can reduce it in any way possible, it's you're only going to help yourself down the line. So other things to consider as well, the university does offer payment plans. Um, I'm a big advocate of the payment plans and especially using it in combination with student loans if you know that's an option you have to pursue, right? So we mentioned that unsubsidized graduate loan for $20,500. It's obviously not going to uh, cover the cost of your tuition and fees, but if you can take out that loan that has a little bit of a lower interest rate to avoid taking out the grad plus loan and then um, financing the rest of it on a payment plan, that's something that, that can be really helpful. So the university has, I believe, five different payment plans. Um, the earliest one you can enroll in is the summer before you're starting um, the semester. And depending on the time that you um, enroll in the plan, 
there's a different down payment amount and then there's different monthly uh, payments. So it might be a 20% down payment and then you split the rest of your balance in between four or five payments. And then, you know, it's uh, it graduates to maybe 40% down and then you have to split the balance and, you know, three or four payments. So um, definitely something to consider, even if it's just a small amount that you can afford to go into the payment plan. I mean, really when it talks to lowering your um, indebtedness, any little bit helps. We also have iGrad scholarship search engine. So once you're able to log into the, um, the website, there's, um, you know, they have a, a search engine there and you can kind of play around with it and say, you know, I don't want anything too specific. I want, I want um, very general scholarship opportunities or I want scholarship opportunities that are for, you know, four-year programs or three-year programs or two-year programs. So that's something that's very helpful in addition to the other um, scholarship, external scholarship links that were provided earlier in this presentation. How does iGrad work? I mean, it's it's very user friendly and it's very intuitive. There's a navigation, you log in, there's a navigation bar to your left, and then there's a dashboard up top where you can click on different topics. You can visit their mindfulness portal um, and really just play around with what they have to offer. If you're in the um, process of purchasing a home or looking to move, it can even help you with that as well. And um, we do have the QR code here. So if you wanna take a video tour of iGrad of that platform, that can be pretty helpful. Um, but that concludes the, uh, that pretty much concludes this presentation. If anybody has questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I'm gonna go through the, um, I saw a couple during the presentation pop up in the um, chat. So let me just look at that very briefly to see if anything else is there. Second. I just wanted to mention again um, that we will be sharing the slides on the Open House website, um, including this uh, recording. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you were in the admission session, we recommend that you uh, uh, start those external scholarship searches concurrently with your application because there are deadlines that are happening now. And the way that scholarship search works is you have your application deadline and there's a delay for the review. And so um, all of the scholarships for your term of entry, um, they should be submitted now. So um, I recommend, um, creating accounts for those uh, scholarship um, search engines so that you can filter by your academic experience, demographic, um, and uh, you won't have to sift through a bunch of scholarships that don't pertain to you. So that is um, a recommendation that um, I wanna emphasize because the deadlines once you're admitted, um, the deadlines are for future review. And so that doesn't help you um, when you're entering the program because then you'll have to wait for that decision to come through. Um, there is somebody who asks about general tuition costs for international students. So tuition for domestic and international students is the same. I'm dropping a link in the chat. Um, that just has some general tuition as well as cost of attendance information. Another student asks, as an international applicant, one financial aspect I want to be mindful of is housing. Are you able to speak to graduate student accommodation? Unfortunately, I'm not. Um, I know it's definitely an option. A lot of students are international and they live on campus. Um, Sarah, I'm not sure if you have specific information in terms yeah. of housing. So any of the GSEP merit funding is for tuition only. Um, so we do not have any housing scholarships. Um, the way that graduate housing works is um, once you're admitted and you decide to enroll, you can apply for housing. And um, if you know sooner, then we recommend applying sooner than later because um, the review is done in a lottery system. So um, the sooner that you apply for housing, the sooner you will know. And they will prioritize incoming students who are coming from further away. 
So just also keep that in mind. There are um, resources online for off-campus housing assistance so that you can peruse right now just to get a sense of what housing costs um, in and around the neighborhood. And um, many students will opt to, um, to use that resource um, when they first come if they're not able to get housing. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have for that. Um, yeah, what's the next question? So does the dual degree cost more than just the regular degree? I mean, it costs more in the sense that to complete a dual degree, you're here longer. Um, so it's just a longer program. So you're you're paying more tuition in that sense, but there's not a specific higher cost associated with it, you know, per credit or per semester. Yeah. So as Marion mentioned, um, students are billed um, semesterly. So each semester you will be enrolled full time, regardless of whether you are in a dual program or not. All uh, degree students will be enrolled full time and there's a flat rate for um, between 12 and 18 credits. Great. Are there any other questions? Again, this presentation, um, the slides will be shared in the open house page uh, early next week. Um, and I see that um, there's another question. So um, typically, that I'm not sure about the resident assistantships, but that's something that you can check in with um, resident housing um, about because that's managed through resident housing. That's not something that we manage. And um, for from what I understand, um, uh, I don't know of any graduate uh, GSAP students who have been a resident assistant. I, I dropped the link for Columbia Housing in the chat if anybody wants to scroll through the website. Um, you can always feel free to contact Columbia Housing directly to inquire about that. So um, the dual degree, um, let me just add a link to um, so here are the dual degree options in the link that I've shared and depending on the dual degree that you're interested in you can click on the details for a sample of the sequence of semesters that you'll be um, attending and um, and the dual degree option is um, will allow you to complete the program in um, in less semesters, sometimes less uh, one year less or uh, one semester less. So that is the savings option. And um, within the PDF details, you can see um, uh, how many semesters you would be enrolling to complete the program. And um, that's how much you would base your tuition cost because you would be billed semesterly. So basically when you're considered a like CDP student, you're paying that tuition. When you're considered MR, MR, you're paying that tuition. So the CDP program is a three semester program. So you're being billed um, that semesterly rate. So there's three semesters. And then for the MR program, it's a three year program. So you'll be billed um, that rate each semester. So it's six, it's approximately $67,000 for the year for the MR program, but it is a three year program. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. OK, 
Okay, great. Um, again, we will share the uh, slides online and I hope that you were able to copy and paste the links that Rosie shared before of the external scholarship um, sites that we recommend creating accounts for. And again, they're also located on our website. So if, if you um, uh, if you forget, then uh, they're also listed on our website. And I always recommend that you create these accounts so that um, you can apply for scholarships that pertain to your experience and academics. And also, so you're not missing out on any early deadlines. And the early deadlines are the most important deadlines because um, once, you know, if you're admitted in March, you want to have that additional planning on top because um, the GSOP scholarships, the merit scholarships at the time of admission, they're, they're not guaranteed for everyone who's admitted. So even if you have gotten a uh, merit scholarship at GSAP, you might need additional funding to uh, support your living um, expenses and um, additional uh, scholarship to support other tuition payments that have not been covered. Okay, I know it's been a really long day and I, I appreciate um, all of you sitting through the two hours or even um, for the one hour. Uh, thank you for joining us and um, let us know if you have any questions and we look forward to uh, seeing your applications in the future.